Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. I'm Dave Rukoski, and along with Diana Likes and Linda Grace Frost, we are your worship associates for today. We want to particularly welcome our friends from UU congregations. UU of San Mateo, UU Fellowship of Redwood City, and the UU community of Lake County. Some of you are joining us here in person and many over YouTube live. In this pandemic time, overall church participation has been reduced, which is a loss. But there's been a gain also. For we now cherish increased camaraderie that has bloomed, blossomed like summer flowers amongst our congregations. Our shared principles are the glue that binds us together. The first principle is to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person. This principle is the foundation of our spiritual journey, just as it is foundational to democracy. Unitarian Universalists have made a conscious choice to affirm this principle, and thus it follows that we welcome all, all who want to join us on a principled spiritual journey. So again, I say welcome. Welcome to this Sunday service that has been lovingly, lovingly crafted for you. We do have a or an interactive joys and concerns stone ritual in our service today. For those of you who are here, I invite you, if you have not yet picked up a stone, to do so now. The stones are at the welcome table in the back of the room. After the stone ritual, there will be an opportunity for you to speak out your joyous concerns, speak them out loud. There's also a book at the welcome table where you can write your joys and concerns to be read by a worship associate. And now, Linda Grace will introduce our opening song. Hello everyone in the room and hello folks at home. Glad you're here today. Um, I'd like us for a moment to just take a big deep breath together. Ready? Our opening uh, hymn is from the African American spiritual tradition and I felt like we needed to take a breath here. So many songs that we enjoy and that, and that we sing um, come from a tradition of suffering, of enslaved people. And I want to honor the tradition of um, songs being passed down through generations without having been written down. Because it was, it was a crime to teach slaves to read and write at, at, um, at one time. So all of these songs have come down through oral tradition. And I'm grateful and sorry. So this, this song um, is about the indom indomitable spirit of hope in the face of, of unspeakable horror and, and suffering that was experienced on a daily basis. There is more love somewhere. Let's take another long breath before we begin. Somewhere, somewhere, 
lighting of the chalice. I will now light this UUCC chalice flame, a ritual which unites us all together as Unitarian Universalists. Due to fire regulations, our chalice flows from battery power. <laughs> now please join me in reading Come We Now Out of the Darkness by Amy Furster. The words are in your order of service. Come we now out of the darkness of our unknowing and the dusk of our dreaming. Come we now from far places. Come we now into the twilight of our awakening and the reflection of our gathering. Come we now all together. We bring unilluminated our dark caves of doubting. We seek Undazzled the clear light of understanding. May the sparks of our joining kindle our resolve, brighten our spirits, reflect our love, and unshadow our days. Come we now, enter the dawning. The meta chant was given to us years ago by uh, Tovas Page. Many of you remember her. Um, metta is a Pali word meaning loving kindness. If you'd like to discuss the, the, the Buddhist practice of loving kindness, we can talk after the, after the service. Um, but for now, please stand in body or spirit to extend blessings to each and all as we chant the metta chant together. It's in the order of service, and folks at home, it will be on your screen. today's reading. Today's reading is a poem by Kwame Dawes. He's a prolific poet and author who was born in Ghana, raised in Jamaica, and now lives in the U.S. He's teaching at the University of Nebraska and in Pacific University's MFA program in Oregon. This is a poem about loss and about the courage to go on living while carrying that loss. It's called, When Light Leaves Her Eyes. Who owns you? There is in the eyes of those who have lost the bodies of their impossible loves, the young, unformed perfection of youth dead before the inevitable corruption of time. There is in the eyes of those who have lost this love to the vagaries of war, the drugged look of those whose light has faded. 
what has been taken from you. It is this that owns you. And you, shell of all joy, must walk through this city as beautiful as the last summer flowers. Thank you, Tom. That was a beautiful reading, as beautiful as the last summer flowers. And now I have the privilege of introducing today's worship leader, who will present his sermon entitled, As Beautiful as the Last Summer Flowers, Ambiguous Loss, and New Hope. Bill Haviland was born and raised in Rapid City, South Dakota and came to California by way of Stanford. Bill somewhat reluctantly participated in the 2017-2018 shared pulpit class sponsored by UU San Mateo. He has since become one of UUCC's favorite lay speakers with the added distinction during the pandemic of, of having taken on most every Sunday service production role. At work, Bill is part of Google's applied science team. At home, Bill enjoys hiking coastal trails, painting watercolors, beautiful watercolors, I might add, and feeding wild backyard birds. Bill will tell you in his sermon today that he is not a theologian, but I will tell you he is a deep thinker. Thank you, Dave. What letter? L. Stands for louder. It is today's volume control for this volume challenged speaker. <laughs> Today, I want to talk about our collective experience of this pandemic. Not the meaning of the pandemic. As Dave says, I'm no theologian. I just want to give some language about our pandemic experience. If you were to ask me directly, maybe I'd admit to preferring going into work rather than working from home. But after working from home over two years, as if the household ivy has grown around and through me, I've adapted to working from home, to the memory of working at home. And now that I'm the, on the threshold of retirement, maybe that's okay. This sermon today was inspired by a book review last December in the New York Times. The book by Pauline Boss is entitled The Myth of Closure, subtitle, Ambiguous Loss in the Time of the Pandemic. A good fit, I thought, for the August 2022 Touchstones theme ambiguity and paradox. So I penciled in this topic for UUCC. And as the months of 2022 rolled forward, events overtook me, overtook us, really. Now I've just become used to seeing and perceiving ambiguous losses, experiencing ambiguous losses by me and by those around me. Like working from home, this idea or viewpoint or emotion, ambiguous loss, has overtaken me. Like another household vine, maybe, or like the memory of the last summer flowers. What is ambiguous loss? 
<coughs> Pauline Boss first published this in 1999 to describe a kind of grief with no clear beginning. Two classic examples, a spouse in cognitive decline with no clear time of onset, but nonetheless, one might discover oneself having drifted into this journey involuntarily and without foreshadowing. A second example, loss of military pilot fight fathers, child and spouse. They both still have a father and a husband, but you know, these fathers, they're shot down and imprisoned during the Vietnam War. And for the child and spouse, they both ha still have a father and a husband, and it's also as if they do not. Ambiguous loss describes this in-between state. A third canonical example, victims of racism. People acquire education, skills, language abilities, cultural knowledge, and at the same time, a certain kind of economic or social invisibility, a certain ineligibility to their full potential. Able to look around the corner and see others prosper, but not quite able to move around the corner and join the prosperity. Glass ceilings, glass walls, invisible boundaries, the wrong side of a racial barrier. As I've said, I bring up this concept of ambiguous loss as a means for describing our experience with this pandemic. One week we have friends, some so close they're eligible for hugs, walks, lunch dates, then Household isolation, not just a month or two, not just a year, but over two years. It's heartbreaking. And after your heart is broken, the pandemic continues still. In my personal case, by working from home, I'm able to conclude projects but not really launch new ones. And by slow degrees, I lose my spiritual guide, two spiritual guides actually, but who's counting, into some abyss of ambiguity. I know I'm not alone in think feeling this way. The pandemic has been hard on all of us. Under stress, in pain, there's a natural human tendency, I suppose, to retreat, to pull back, to help less, to close down. Many congregations have experienced this. This decline in volunteerism, this decline in wanting to attend or to join. And as today's poet Kwame Dawes says, what has been taking, taken from you, it is this that owns you. So anger, I suppose, it becomes an option lashing out, recasting the mistake of another into a hill of insult and a mountain of woe. Anger, it's on the list of empirically observed responses. I've observed this, and I'm pretty sure some of those in attendance have either been angry themselves or observed anger somehow made worse by the context of the pandemic, or have been the target of such anger. 
at the June 26 UU General Assembly, the opening reflections dwelled on this somewhat in that polite and polished, self-effacing rhetoric of UUGA. Over the pandemic, angrily blaming others, it's become a sometimes thing within various UU congregations. Anyway, empirically, anger is on the list of observed responses, seeing the worst or assuming the worst in certain people. I note in passing these two core responses, withdrawal and anger. Psychologists call these the avoidance and approach impulses. I'll have more to say about this shortly. There is a third response, paradoxical either in its origin or by its effect. And that is to name the pain as pain, the grief as grief, the never-ending open-ended sorrow as sorrow our broken heart as a broken heart. There's a concept out there called emotional intelligence. And in this case, it simply means appropriately naming to yourself the emotions you experience. You don't heal by doing this, by the way. You just make progress. There's a Yiddish word for these feelings of ambiguous loss. Say broken Kate. Say broken Kate has an approximate English uh, cognate brokenness, if that helps you latch onto these four consonant rich syllables. And, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm running a multimedia presentation with zero electricity. Um, <laughs> Here's the 13, it's like nine consonants and four vowels uh, there. Um, I'm sure someone at this moment is Googling it. Um, anyway, say broken Kate is the quality of brokenness that suggests something not needing a quick fix, a bittersweet sort of wisdom state. Say broken Kate is to be held, stood over, contemplated, maybe honored even. I think, say, broken cake as a particular kind of seed, watered by tears. Say, broken cake's seed does not grow to heal our brokenheartedness. It grows around and into us creates a new perspective on ourselves, becomes part of ourselves. For Pauline Boss, recognizing ambiguous loss, say, say broken Kate in its own right, this is not healing. It's acknowledging life's complexity. And experiencing broken Kate does not exclude joy or happiness. One learns to live with this complex of emotions, maybe side by side with, say, broken Kate, visiting more joyful, happier moments. For even with, say, broken Kate, we sing. We continue to sing. We, the brokenhearted, we can still lift our chins and sing, to sing as if there is more life somewhere. As today's featured poet, Kwame Dawes writes, and you, shell of all joy, must walk through this city as beautiful as the last summer flowers.
there's an experience common to many astronauts. They look at the Earth and they see suddenly tiny a blue, green, and white marble. In that moment, they feel unity with humankind and with the planet. Psychologists call this experience the small self. Carl Sagan called it wonder. Philosophers like Kant call this the sublime. Religious traditions call this awe. In awe, the emotion called awe, the background noise of our monkey brain dims. We become more attentive and our problem solving centers perk up. And in awe, we also feel small and vulnerable. So the awe response has both the impulse to approach. That's wow, that's wonderful. And the impulse to avoid because we're so little. Indeed, this duality about awe is reflected in the Hebrew word for awe, yira, which is traditionally translated as both awe and wonder and fear. And by tradition, yira is the last chapter in texts on the Jewish ethical system called Musar. Awe is that big that gnarly. In Musar, after awe, there's only epilogue. Indeed, awe is stronger than our other emotions, stronger than compassion even. Psychologist Adam Omri writes that there is something unique about the small self and its feeling of interconnectedness and vulnerability that causes individuals to reevaluate their priorities and behave for the greater good. So, so there's a paradox here. You might think that being brokenhearted would be a good reason for not doing anything because our hearts have been broken. And you might think that experiencing the small self would good, give good cover for not doing anything because we're so little and insignificant. And you might think that bearing an ambiguous loss would be a great excuse for retreating from the world because we're grieving, damn it. And you'd be half right, because that's the vulnerability part, the avoidant part of these emotions about which I'm speaking. But what really happens is that by these experiences, we are changed. The memories of these experiences grow around and into us, and through them, we come to see the world differently. We feel both more interconnected and more vulnerable. There is both an avoidant response and an approach response, both available from this same emotion. Say, Broken Kate stands as the essence of UUCC's pandemic response, or maybe half of our response. We witnessed the same drop in volunteerism as everyone else, maybe more. I don't really know. 
We perceive this grief in other congregations also. Or maybe just imagined it. I don't really know. Anyway, we reached out. Some congregations didn't get this, some did. Some may be just glad some new faces showed up. I don't really know. Anyway, we, UUCC, carrying our, say, broken cape, we showed up. Some of the time, imperfectly. Our hearts still broken, by the way. I'm not talking about a cure. I don't really offer any cures. Say broken cape, it's just part of us now. In other forums, I've listed UUCC's successes. I won't detail them here, but the list includes worship services, pastoral care, fundraisers for nonprofits, and reaching out to other congregations. When your heart is broken, it might seem harder to help others. That's the avoidant response. But I am here to report that helping can become more natural also. That's the approach response. Both responses are there. Inside our, say, broken cape. Inside our brokenness which now sits inside of us, now as part of us. Does that seem like a paradox? Because experiencing grief, ambiguous loss, say broken Kate, it changes us, all of us my fellow co-travelers of this pandemic journey, we've changed. We have experienced the loss, ambiguous or otherwise, lost that feeling of connectedness. This has broken so many of our hearts. We've experienced, say, broken Kate. And by fate and with reluctance, so many we know also experience, say, broken these feelings of ambiguous loss, these seeds watered by tears, giving us reluctantly new perspective on ourselves. This we can share quietly or out loud and know that this too about many of the people next to us. To recognize, say, broken Kate in another to recognize such emotions in another, this is empathy. And where there is empathy, there can be a kind of hope, what Pauline Boss calls new hope. Psychologist Mary Lamia writes that hope does not extinguish grief, but it can take our memories to better or different future places. So there's a call to action, maybe, if you're in a receptive mood. Two thoughts to ponder. One, recall that one of the canonical examples of experiencing ambiguous loss is experiencing racism. I am not reducing the experience of racism exclusively to ambiguous loss, but it's emotionally adjacent. It's emotionally adjacent. That's one thought. Two. By living through this pandemic, 
Many or most of us have experienced ambiguous losses. From this experience, you probably know more than you really ever wanted to know about ambiguous loss. And that person sitting next to you, socially distanced, of course, and also the person walking down the grocery aisle, not masked or all masked up, has likely experienced ambiguous loss also. Gives us something in common, sort of, approximately. Huh. Not identical experiences, of course, but emotionally adjacent. <clears throat> emotionally adjacent. And we likely hold this in common with every person we encounter. On the sidewalks of Half Moon Bay, California, on the paths, streets, roads, and runways of this red, white, and blue nation or nations. On this blue, green, and white marble. So tiny in the night sky. From a certain point of view. Anyway, that's my second thought. Now, blessings. We need blessings. Help us out by sharing some of your blessings. Now is a good time to help someone, to bless the person next to you for their presence, to show up somewhere with a question like, how can I help? To bless the world with new hope of your own making. For such hope, though it does not extinguish grief, it does work to refashion our future memories into something beautiful, as beautiful as the last summer flowers. And now, allow me to thank you, all of you, for your presence here today and for your patience here today. Amen.
Thank you, Tom, for your music. And thank you, Bill, for a thoughtful sermon that highlighted our shared experience with loss in this pandemic. Now I get to talk with you about a, another type of sharing. Bill asked you to address ambiguous loss. I want you to experience right here and now some unambiguous loss. Loss on the net side of your financial ledger. <laughs> Yes, this is the time in each service for the generosity pitch for financial support. As you've been told many times, when you give to a good cause, you have a gain. In this case, a gain on the net side of your spiritual ledger. Today, I want you to think of that gain as new hope. In one way or another, our last three First Sunday UUCC sermons have touched on hope. Hope seems dimmed in the face of the rise of illiberalism in our homeland and all around the world. Two First Sundays ago, Reverend Esther Wallace asked us to choose hope. Choosing hope is different than feeling hope. It is the conscious choice to be in the world with hope as a foundational principle. Last first Sunday, the Reverend Russ Mink asked us to fuel our hope through action, through social action. And today, Bill touched on the concept of new hope. This all has led me to ask you to choose unambiguous loss and promote hope. If you cannot contribute now financially, please know that those who contribute their time and talents are beloved as nurturers of hope. There is a donation basket on the sign-in table for those here. Check writing instructions are in today's order of service, as are instructions for gifting online. If you're up for a specific action today, please subscribe to the UUCC YouTube channel that some of you are watching on at this very moment. We need 30 more subscribers to reach 100 subscribers. And, and I have been told that extra good things happen for a channel with over 100 subscribers. And your subscribing would be a nice gift to us. While these com collections take place, Tom will lead us in a couple rounds of We Who Are Gathered. For people who have attended UUC before, you will likely recognize this song tune as We of the Coast Side, the UU Congregational Hymn, sung in round. Today, retitled and ever so slightly tweaked for an extra big hug, Tom wrote the music, Bill wrote the lyrics, which were inspired by this community. So it's in your order of service, back page, and we will sing it all together once, and then we'll break into three groups. First two um, people on the, on the side there, and the first row will be led by Linda Grace. I'll lead the people in the middle here, and Bill will lead the people on that side. We'll sing it in the canon, but first, We'll sing it all together, and it goes. We who are gathered, we care for our neighbors, seek for more justice, and sing for more peace. Open in heart and bringing more love for all. 
So now everybody together. We who are gathered, we care for our neighbors, seek for more justice and sing for more peace. Open in heart and bringing more love for all. Okay, now we'll do it as a canon. In the grace. We We who are desert, we care for our neighbors. Seek for more justice and sing for more peace. Open in heart and bring more love. For we who are desert, we care for our neighbors. Seek for more justice and sing for more peace. Open in heart and bring. Okay, we're, we're going to work on our synchronization next time. <laughs> Thank you. We now extinguish our candle flame. Please join me in reading these words by Elizabeth Sayla Jones. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we bury in our hearts. So our closing hymn um, this, uh, uh, this afternoon uh, is number 1053 in the UU Teal Hymnal, How Could Anyone? It was written by Libby Roderick, singer, songwriter, and activist who uh, uh, lives in Alaska some of the time. Her song has been sung around the world. Uh, I heard her first at a women's conference. Um, there wasn't a dry eye in the entire uh, uh, assembly Hall. Um, it's been translated into many, many languages, sung for the AIDS orphans in Zambia, um, in, in Japanese, for women re or people recovering from uh, eating disorders. So it's, it's a quite short song, so we'll sing it three times. First we'll just sing it, and then the second time, sing it to someone. Sing it to your neighbor. And the third time, sing it for yourself. How could anyone? Please stand. Folks at home, please stand.